once um, John uh, and Matthew have had a chat, then uh, we'll open up the floor for questions. Uh, can I ask you please to, in the usual way, to use the chat facility for that? And I will either try to come to you, um, will unmute you, or I will moderate, um, particularly if, if there's a lot of questions and we need to group them and just try and get through as many as possible so we don't, don't slow things down too much. Um, Matthew, you will all know as a columnist in The Times in particular, but he has been active in journalism and broadcasting ever since he stood down from the House of Commons, having been the Member of Parliament for West Derbyshire, Patrick McCoughlin's predecessor, indeed, uh, and um, before that worked in the number 10 political team uh, for Margaret Thatcher. Um, Matthew, you're very welcome. John, you are very welcome and a very old friend of uh, CEF and CGE before that. Um, I will hand over to, to you, John, to start on the interview. Thank you very much, David. And of course, Matthew was also uh, the successor to uh, Jim Scott Hopkins in West Derbyshire in 79, uh, who had left to go and lead the Conservative MEPs at, uh, in Brussels. So it's uh, a great delight, Matthew, to have you uh, uh, on board for this uh, conversation. I thought we would look at some of the issues that you've raised over the years, particularly with a European flavour, perhaps, uh, and see where your um, thinking has developed and how it's nuanced in, in recent times. And let's start with um, Europe itself. And uh, come the referendum, I, I seem to remember you um, you're, you're issuing a sort of uh, a, a concerned yes, uh, which was a bit like uh, uh, Polonius saying, neither a Remainer nor a Lever be. Uh, and uh, stay for now or but don't leave yet and that sort of message uh, and I wonder how you would uh, describe your views now. Probably uh, they haven't changed much. It's always said of columnists that we are doomed if we carry on writing for long enough either to repeat ourselves or contradict ourselves and I think I, I, I think I'm probably closer to repeating myself than contradicting myself when I, I say towards the whole place. Uh, it, it, they used a kind of English that was translated from something else and appeared to be English, but the words didn't really mean anything. I felt there was a sort of smugness, a sort of we know better than the nation states feeling about things. And, and I have maintained that view of the European Union and also a fear that it will tangle itself up in and bog itself down in uh, procedure and, and bureaucracy and, and lose, if it, if it ever had, the more romantic vision of what the European Union could be. But through all that, I, I have seen that it was a brave, is a brave and, and, and noble idea and fitfully is trying to bring people together in a world where countries are, are trying to separate themselves uh, from each other. I have also seen, as it were, the true colours of a lot of the anti-European movement in, in, in Britain, which I, I think is backward looking, is Little England, uh, does not really have this, um, this wonderful view of a, of a, of a new uh, unbound uh, nation um, striding like a colossus across the, the globe, but, but, but is really all wrapped up, I, I think, in uh, inaccurate, nostalgia and quite a lot of dislike of uh, the other side of the English Channel. So I have come down, in a sense, both firmly and, and also hesitantly on the side of staying in the European Union. And as the, as the referendum campaign continued, I grew so to dislike the dishonesty of the other side, the negativism of the other side, the banging on about immigration 
of the other side that, that um, in the end, I, I, I ended up a, a firm pro-European and, and still am, though fairly despairingly. Okay, and, and as, as we've moved forward from, from the days of the referendum, come to the European Parliament elections, uh, where a lot of us, I think, were uh, hesitant as to how we should cast our votes, because uh, uh, there was very little about Europe in the manifesto at that time, uh, and very little positive stuff. Um, and you at that time, I think, um, along with uh, other notable people like Michael Heseltine, uh, said you will either give or lend your vote to uh, another party, the Liberal Democrats. Uh, and um, you called and you continue to call for uh, a new respectable centre party. Uh, but of course, we've seen the SDP sort of fly and soar and then crash. And we've more recently seen Change UK doing something similar and not really making much headway. And short of a PR, do you think there's any hope of getting a, your, the party that you want to create it? Yes, I do. But I think the Labour Party has to die first or has to be obviously in its de death throes. Then I think something will take wing, even under first past the post. I, I, I did uh, lend my vote to the Liberal Democrats. I've never been a Liberal Democrat and I'm not one now, but I, I couldn't bring myself to, to vote for candidates for the, the party was, that was taking the stance that it was uh, on Europe. I, I am increasingly, and just really in the last few months, uh, seized of the opinion that the Labour Party has a terrible capacity for stifling the birth of anything to replace it, while at the same time being increasingly unable ever to win uh, a, an election. And it could take a long time in dying. And as long as it does, I think it's going to be very hard for anything else to form on the centre. But I, 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 I keep hoping. Well, in most of our um, sister countries and sister parties, the, uh, where there is this cent more central government, uh, it does depend on um, having a voting system which uh, enables those people to be elected. And that was, of course, the problem with Change UK. It collapsed because it couldn't get uh, people to vote for it. Uh, yes, John. Numbers. Yes, but, um, you know, you, say, you talk about the SDP as an example of why we, we, we shouldn't be too hopeful. The, the, I, I see the SDP in the 1980s as uh, teaching us the opposite lesson. It damn nearly succeeded. Yeah. And yeah. if the Labour Party hadn't panicked, uh, and if um, uh, finally under Tony Blair, it hadn't realised that it was faced with um, extinction, uh, uh, and that the SDP was going to fly, that, then I do think the SDP might have succeeded. Um, it's a pity that uh, movements that nearly succeed are afterwards categorised as uh, exemplars of why it wasn't worth trying. True. But in fact, the SDP was nearly all one party. I think apart from Christopher Brockerbank Fowler, uh, all the others were former Labour uh, individuals from the top of the party. And that yes. gave a certain strength. Yeah, but that was because in those days the the problem was that the Labour Party had gone mad. Yep. Uh, the the problem now the Conservative Party hasn't gone mad, but but it's lurching off in a, a fairly unsavoury direction. Right. So um, I, 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 and the Labour Party I think are, are going nowhere. So I, I think a, a new centre party might draw support from former supporters of both those parties, or the Conservative Party might, might notice that it's going in the wrong direction and come back into the centre, in which case I should love to rejoin it. Very good. Well, let's um, move, move on. And uh, tonight's news, of course, is all about Europe, but also Ireland. Uh, and you've um, written, um, I have to say much to my surprise, and probably it was a collective gasp at reading your piece about um, Edwin Poots, it sounds like a creation from the diary of a nobody, uh, but he's actually a somebody in, in Northern Ireland politics and the DUP. Um, and you said we should be patient with him. But why, why, why do you hope that um, we will uh, remove our sinking feeling and think that this man might lead to some positive compromise? I, I don't have very high hopes, but I think that somebody should be given a chance. And I don't like to see somebody pilloried for their religious beliefs, even, even if the beliefs are, are crazy, uh, in my view. Uh, Mitt Romney would have made a, a better Republican president than Donald Trump, but, but 
he is a Mormon and Mormons, though they include many wonderful, excellent people, subscribe to some, to my view, f fairly bizarre doctrinal beliefs. And um, so Mr. Poots deserves a chance, but, but I, I can't say that the developments in Northern Ireland point in any direction except to the, the, the DUP pursuing a sort of core vote strategy uh, where they will slowly shed doubters in, in all directions and, and end up, I, I think, probably concentrating their own extremism, but I hope not. But does your optimism lie in the, on the side of uh, the continuing membership of the United Kingdom, or does it look towards some form of uh, relationship with the Irish Republic? Well, that's really what I was writing about in the Spectator article that you, you quote, and I wrote it after a long chat with, with Chris Patton. Um, Chris's involvement with Northern Ireland, re remember he led that review into the, uh, what was then the Royal Ulster Constabulary. And, and you can see Chris as a, a, a devout Catholic himself, as somebody who understands both communities or tries to understand and has sympathy for both communities in Northern Ireland. And Chris's view is, is that the Belfast Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement uh, with its provisions uh, for, for a vote on whether Northern Ireland should rejoin the South. Um, the moment um, it appears uh, that, that, that there is a, a majority uh, for reunification in Northern Ireland, that, 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 that this is a recipe for disaster. That the, the, the small Catholic majority, which would be perhaps likely to win such a referendum, cannot or could not drag the Protestant small, the large Protestant minority into reunion with Northern Ireland in anything like a peaceful or satisfactory way. And that until the opinion begins to predominate amongst the Protestant community, that reunification would not be a bad thing, then, then we're, we're looking at a very bleak situation should you get a, a narrow majority for reunification in Northern Ireland. There was no hope in what I was uh, saying. It was, it, it, was, it was pessimistic. Good. Well, let's look, if we may, at another um, concern that many of us have, which is this age of woke that we seem to be uh, living through at the moment, uh, with Colston statue and no platform votes in colleges and so forth. Keir Starmer taking a very private knee in his own office. Uh, and now the young cricketer, Ollie um, Robinson, yes. uh, and others sort of down the line, apparently, uh, being pilloried for something they said at 17. How do you see this playing out? And will common sense come back again? Well, you could add to your, your list uh, John Stonewall, of which I was a founder uh, member, but Stonewall seems to have lost its way uh, as well. Uh, and I shall be interested to, to hear what you all think and, 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 and what some of those uh, listening in on our meeting think. At the start, I, I felt, both as a columnist and, and just as an analyst, I felt that the best thing to do with, with the, the, the mad kind of wokery was just to ignore it, and that the, the, the conservative right, as it were, the Daily Mail and all the rest, were in an unspoken symbiotic relationship with the, the, the mad wokery people because they, they just kept egging each other on and getting angry with each other and grabbing headlines. And so I decided just not to write about it and it was better to ignore them and hope they would go away. But it's not clear they are going away and I, I don't really know what to do about it. We may have reached peak woke. Um, I just have half the feeling that we have, uh, but, but I'm not confident of it. No, well, the latest, I suppose, is the uh, removal of the Queen's picture in Magdalen College at Oxford. And that's, yes, uh, yeah, but that's uh, just student yeah. politics. I'm mean, okay. These, uh, this was the middle common room, and uh, they are graduate students. But that's just student politics, and probably best ignored. I mean, any group of students have the right to put up or remove any picture that they want in their own con common room. I, you know, I, I, I think it's despicable that they should do that, but it is their right. Okay. Let's move on to, to another topic that um, you've been writing about and uh, is certainly on the agenda, not least in Parliament at the moment, and that's the, the aid budget and the cutting from the 0.7%. Uh, and I, I know you've said that um, you think the policy would collapse as soon as we got pictures of um, a dying child in, in one of the recipient countries and so forth. I've always thought that, um, that the justification for 
development aid is also that we actually enable people in these countries to be economically productive. Uh, you, you remove the disease so that they can work. Uh, they can work and they can earn, they can pay taxes and they, they can control their own destiny yeah. rather than coming with begging bowl time after time. Do you think that's also a lesson that we haven't yet learned? Well, I completely agree with you and it is a lesson that we haven't yet learned. Uh, uh, I think it's a little way down the line that we can be thinking realistically about development assistance actually causing the creation of developed countries uh, and an awful lot of our aid is really just emergency relief and I think the best and most easily defensible parts of our aid is is the relief uh, of emergency but 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 after that you're you're right um, we, we should be looking at uh, turning nations into countries that don't need help any longer um, Oddly enough, or perhaps predictably in, enough, John, I, I'm, I am with foreign aid rather as I am with the European Union. Um, about the EU, I remember that staunch defender of the EU, the late Tristan Garrell Jones, my, my very great friend, and, and nobody was more pro. Yeah, I can see Robert Atkins clapping there. And Robert may remember one of the things Tristan used to say. He used to say about the European Union, you always have to remember that it is a, and then he used um, a, a word composed of two words, the second of which was pig, and the first of which began with an F, that is a, it is a FP organization. And I, I, I think there was truth in that, and I feel a little bit the same uh, about quite a lot of development aid, quite a few of the NGOs. I do travel quite widely, especially in Africa. I think our aid is often misdirected. Uh, and I think there is a sort of culture within what they call the aid community of speaking to each other, a, a jargon language, which, which never really leaves the white Toyotas parked near the best hotel in the capital and goes out, for instance, into the African bush. So I would normally be um, a, a critic, a skeptic, of quite a bit of over, uh, our overseas aid and there Rory Stewart uh, uh, agrees with me and he, he was really making a, an excellent start because he does believe in helping in making sure that we helped uh, in, in more productive ways than we were but to cut aid now um, and to, 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 to break our, our promise uh, to, to, to break the, uh, the, the undertaking that, that's contained in the legislation and to do it at a time when so much of the world is in so much trouble, just not only sends the wrong signals, but just is the wrong thing to do. And so I, I'm, I'm able to feel quite passionately that we shouldn't do this at the same time as thinking that we do need to take a rather hard uh, look at uh, the way aid is focused. Good. You refer there to your, your travels. And uh, I, I recall chairing another meeting met some years ago now of, uh, of this group when you and uh, Francis Jacobs came and did a uh, double act on, on your travelling. Great man. Experiences in history. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, it just tempts me to ask you a question. I don't know whether you've written about it, but I, I, I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on it. And that is the, the relationship between this country and South America. Uh, I know Peru and Bolivia and other countries are, are, are particular love to you. Um, but Britain doesn't seem to get its act together in terms of influencing in trade or culture or whatever, in the same way perhaps Germany does. And I wonder if you, it's noticed in South America, whether we should do more. In a sense, it isn't noticed in South America because we are not noticed as a, a nation in South America as, as we, we are um, in so many other parts of the, the world, partly, I suppose, because we were uh, never except for the, the Falklands and um, British Guyana, we were never really an imperial power in, in South America. I, I, I do think that uh, improving links and trade with South America does partly depend on the politics, the democratic politics of South American nations. You, you can um, form a, a relationship with, with Brazil and begin to feel that Brazil is the, the coming United States of America, and then they, they just seem to keep short-circuiting and, and going wrong. Uh, but there's a streak of madness um, in the governance of, of Bolivia uh, and ask any other South American who isn't Bolivian and they, they will agree with that, that, that makes that country remote as it is rather difficult to reach. Peru is different. Um, again, our friend Tristan 
Garrel Jones, who, who, is, who is actually decorated with medals from Peru, was a great believer in, in Peru and, and in Chile. And Margaret Thatcher was very keen on Chile, not always for the right, the right reasons. So there are, and, and Colombia, which I, I know and love very well. Those, those three countries, I think there's, there is great scope. But you know, you, 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 you look at Venezuela, held out to me as a, as a boy, as one, one of the emerging democracies of, um, of Latin America, and it all fell apart. So uh, they, they've got to do their bit. But we do have uh, the direct link through Guyana, and that's the country I have been to and seen the, um, its needs and, and, and so forth, and alongside uh, French and Dutch uh, uh, Guyanas as, as well. As. So is that not a, a route we could do, which again is close to Venezuela and, uh, and such countries? Maybe it is, John, and I, I, I don't know Guyana at all. I've, I, it's the one place, or one of the places I've never been in South America. And it, other South Americans don't seem to know Guyana very well either. It's something of a mystery, and I, I would love to know more about it. But how much we could do through Guyana, I, I don't know. I think bilateral uh, with emerging countries. It would be nice to have a foreign office minister who spoke Spanish, as, as Tristan did, and, um, and, and really loved the continent. And for that, that minister to stay there for a while, stay there in post and to, to get to know things better. It help us to understand North America too. Yes, yes. Good. Tell me, I mean, one of the um, your activities I, I really enjoy is listening late at night, usually on, I think, um, Radio 4 Extra, uh, to you talking about great lives and interviewing um, individuals about their knowledge of these people. I wonder if, if you'd like to choose for us uh, the great life that you would salute from the continental Europe doesn't have to be within the EU, but, but Europe outside this country. Who, who stands out to you as being uh, one of the great European lives? Oh, it would have to be Voltaire. Oh. Um, you know, a, a, a appalling character in, in lots of ways um, and, and need, needlessly um, insulting in lots of ways. But you know, what a man and um, what a mind and, and, and what courage. I, I would like to know more about Voltaire, though I do suspect that the more you knew about Voltaire, the more mixed your feelings would be about him as a man, but uh, uh, as, a, as an author, as a writer, as an agitator, as an uh, iconoclast, uh, he is um, he's one of the great figures of European history, including the United Kingdom. Uh, not, not least through his, his wonderful Candide. <laughs> yes. But, uh, including the musical, which I've seen. But what, what about... Um, more recent ones, living ones, or living within our generation? Well, they have to be dead um, to be covered by great lives. I want to do General de Gaulle, not necessarily as a thoroughly admirable figure, but as undoubtedly a, a, a great national leader. And uh, the man that finally solved the, uh, Al cut the Gordian knot of Algeria for France, incidentally, it's my view that Algeria is much more important in the history and the mentality of, of modern France than, than French people. They don't like to talk about Algeria at all. It was the most awful war. Millions of people were killed. And if you travel in Algeria, as I have, I rather love the, the country, uh, you just see still barbed wire everywhere across the desert. And it's a story a little like the Spanish Civil War from the viewpoint of Spaniards who don't like to talk about it. America, the, the French don't like to talk about Algeria. De Gaulle solved that. Uh, and um, I, 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 would, I would love to find out more because doing the Great Life, Lives Programme actually is a way of me finding out that the conceit is that I am learning, but the conceit is also the truth. I've often just looked the person up in Wikipedia, got a sense of the sort of areas, the questions I need to ask, and thoroughly enjoy the luxury of having both an enthusiast and an expert to tell me more. So I am in the same position as a lot of my listeners, I think. That's very good. And of course, in a, in a sense, Gerald de Gaulle was the Pope John of, his, of the politics in France, but uh, having been on the side of the settlers and so on in Algeria, and then much to the surprise of Salon and others, uh, turning around and uh, yeah. finding a way out, which is... Well, Perhaps there are lessons for us there that sometimes the way out is to find someone who has been on the other side 
and is able to persuade people on the other side that they're going up a, a cul-de-sac. Uh, perhaps um, I still believe that Boris Johnson could persuade us, not that we should rejoin the European Union, but that we needed a constructive relationship with the U European Un Union, whereas at the moment we appear to be looking to pick fights with them. I can't think Boris Johnson cares for that kind of stuff, but but who knows? Attempts to deconstruct Mr Johnson's mind, I think, are always futile. Great. Well, perhaps one day he will be one of your great lies, but uh, I think not yet. Matthew, that's uh, that was a terrific uh, contribution to our, our thinking and thought, and, uh, and you've entertained us as well as in, informed us. So my thanks to you for, for joining with us, and now I'm going to pass over to our chairman, David, to uh, uh, conduct a Q&A for you. Thank John, you. Thank, you, thank, you, thank you very much indeed. Um, and I, we have a number of questions on the chat. Can I just remind everybody, uh, uh, put a question on the chat, please, and I will either come to you or try to, to moderate my way through the, the list without duplicating over much. Um, uh, this session, uh, I didn't say earlier, is um, to be treated as on the record. That, that's by uh, agreement with, I think, at the suggestion of Matthew. Yeah. So this is all uh, to open above board, no Chatham House rule or anything like that. And you will need, if I call on you, please to unmute yourself ask your question and then please mute yourself again um, once you, you you have put your question to Matthew. I, I'm going to claim chairman's privilege, Matthew, um, as a start while others think about what they want to ask. Um, uh, if you met a young man or woman today who is, let us say, 29 or 30, about the age you were elected to the House of Commons, mm. who, had, who said they were interested in politics, had political ambitions, would you encourage them to pursue those and get involved or would you suggest that they turn their energies and enthusiasm in a different direction? I'm afraid it's it's the latter David I, I do in fact often get that question from from people should I go into politics should I go into the Conservative Party and I suppose the easy answer for someone like you or me um, is yes you should and you should go into the Conservative Party and you should try to to make it better from within but uh, a young woman or man could waste decades of their life hoping that a party is going to be different change to what it is. And were somebody thinking of entering the Conservative Party, I'd want to be quite sure that they, there wasn't anything else they thought they were good at or that they might pursue instead as a career. And likewise, if people are thinking of entering the Labour Party, you know, there is a hope that one day the Labour Party will see the light. But who knows when that will be? And, and um, when you reach um, my age, you realise how short life is and how fast uh, the years go by. And to, to, to impel or encourage any nudge, any young man or woman to, to go into the unsavoury and rather sordid mess that our politics is at the moment is something that at the moment I would hesitate to do. Thank you. Right. I'm, I'm going to call on Sir Robert Atkins uh, and after Robert, um, Robert Morland. Uh, good evening, uh, Matt and John. It's lovely to see you. It is good to be amongst friends. Um, I hope you're hearing me all right. I yes. You are. It's good. Um, first and foremost, you, apropos your last comment, Matthew, you will know that I am the parent of, uh, of a, a young member of parliament on occasions raises the eyebrow to me and uh, a very old mutual friend of ours and says, you know, is it really worth the hassle? I care about this, but I don't know how much longer I want to go on doing it. Uh, and my question really generally is same uh, person and I guess other colleagues uh, have reached the stage that you said in your introduction, namely, I couldn't vote for anyone else. I never could do. But are we now effectively party less. In other words, we haven't got a natural home. Um, all that's got left is the, the beloved leaders running CEF plus a bit of, this, of the TRG. But when you've said that, have we said it all? I, I think that, that both, both, um, both sides of that, uh, that, that both alternative answers uh, have truth. I, I admire Victoria 
very much. I, I think she's absolutely excellent. And I, I know that she would always be a force for, for common sense and, and kindness within the Conservative Party. And I wouldn't want her to be anywhere else. I know how proud you are of her, her Robert. You, you, you send me texts whenever she's done well at something. And I sometimes send you texts. Very proud. Father, on, on the other hand, um, She's an extraordinarily capable person. Not everyone who goes into politics is going to meet the success that, that, that she does. And I, I don't know what the home would be now for, uh, for someone who thinks as um, many of us, us do in politics. It could be within the Conservative Party trying to change it. it, could be within the Liberal Democrats, but wherever you were, you'd be trying to change it. Thank you, Robert Morland. Uh, hello, Matthew. Um, if you were in the shoes of Keir Starmer, how would you approach the EU uh, in Parliament at the moment? Would you just keep quiet? Or do you think that he should try to look for every opportunity for criticising the government, or particularly when there's a dispute between Britain and the EU, um, and get some points from that? Particularly, um, the, the argument is he needs to win back Remainers who went to the Greens and the Liberal and uh, Lib Dems. I think he needs to do something, the occasional something, to, to remind Remainers that he still thinks it was a mistake to leave the European Union. Uh, just, just in case anybody sh should suppose that he's forgotten any of that. But beyond that, I don't see any great political advantage for Keir, Keir Starmer in banging on uh, about Europe. Um, it, Boris Johnson will try to confect quarrels and anybody who doesn't take the British side in any of these quarrels is going to risk looking as though they're being unpatriotic and supporting the bad guys. And I don't envy Keir Starmer in knowing how to deal with that. But uh, it would be nice if there would be a speech that he would make from which could be extracted words that made it clear that he still think we think thinks that we made a mistake, but that he realizes we've now just got to make the best of it. Um, I'm going to ask um, Tom Fole uh, to come in, who's got a question very relevant to this. Hi. Um... Do you see a leader capable of leading a new party and winning support? There seems to be a, a dearth of leaders in Parliament. Well, I was a bit keen uh, on, on Rory Stewart, but um, he's uh, the pram in the hallway. Uh, mm. he's, he's got two children now and very happy in a nice house in Connecticut lecturing mm. at Yale. So that's that, I think, as far as Rory is, is concerned. I... I I think Andy Street um, is, mm. is a, a great guy and a, a very effective politician and is the kind of person I would like to see amongst the leadership of the Conservative Party. And, you know, you go up to Scotland, you know, why did Ruth, why did she quit? There are these people, you know, Ruth, Andy Street, they're my kind of Conservatives. But I, I, I think, uh, is it Tom? I, I think, Tom, that it, it, there isn't anybody obviously ready, but cometh the hour, cometh the woman or man. Uh, Ivan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir David. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Paris, for, for the great words. I vividly remember your most recent event a couple of years ago, uh, uh, a live event with, with CGE. Uh, so very, very happy to have you again. Thank you for joining us. And thank you also for your advice for young people in terms of party politics. Um, what are, uh, bearing that in mind, what are alternative ways that young people can affect the positive change uh, in British politics? Thank you very much. Gosh, um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a deep question to which I, I need to give deeper thought than I can do in the time available. But I, 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 I think on social media, it, it is important, even though I, I don't tweet, I read but uh, the tweets, but I don't tweet. But I think on, on, on social media, it is important that people of a moderate viewpoint speak up because especially on social media, it, it appears to be the extremes that get, get heard, that if you, if you don't shout and if you aren't a bit bitter one way or the other, you tend not to be noticed. And it's, it, it's 
terribly important. I feel that reading the columns underneath my own, reading the comments underneath my own Times mm -hmm. columns. So I, the, every now and again, someone who's just obviously very balanced and and um, and, and 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 reasonable about things and good-hearted uh, pipes up, and you think, thank God for that. You know. Or, it isn't just a nest of trolls out there. So, so I do think that on the social media, we should encourage people who are, are good at doing that kind of thing to do it. And well, as every conservative knows, there are so many civic organizations in which you can make a difference, which are not necessarily the, the Conservative Party or, or the Labour Party. But it's for each person, I think, uh, as an individual to think how they can contribute. Um. Uh, Asya Odriozola. Has Asya gone? I'll move. Can you hear and... me now? Can you yes, hear I can hear you now. Yeah. Yes. All right, cool, cool. Far away. Um, well, I, I didn't place a question in there, but um, thinking about the last answer Matthew shared with us, by young people coming into politics and about social media. I uh, just a reflection about the issue uh, because, because I, I work in the field of social media and communications. And one of the things that it always appears interesting to me that if you want to, uh, to create influence, you have to have a very good reason for your audience to want to get involved. And at the moment, even though social media appears to be dictated to a great extreme by algorithms and the interest of, uh, yeah, for instance, if you, if you are interested in bad news, the algorithm would look that you have an interest in such, and then they would feed you more bad news. So the way to get around it, uh, it looks to me as to create initiatives, not so much focus on politics, but more focus on um, interests of what the, that audience that we are trying to reach are talking about. And yes. becoming ourselves the facilitators of their reality for them to want to join us as the facilitators of that reality they enjoy. Yes. Um, so that, does it make sense? It, it makes complete sense. And you know, to take someone who is probably not a conservative, mm -hmm. look at Marcus Rashford. Uh, for instance, uh, using the, the skill and celebrity that he has in a completely different field uh, to, to, uh, to, to help shape public opinion on, on, on something that in the end is, is political. In all these fields, so, you know, in soup kitchens, in, in food banks, uh, in, in uh, issues like uh, overseas aid, particularly the enthusiasm of the young uh, can, can be, I think, effectively engaged and, and may in the end shepherd them towards politics or towards party politics in one direction or another, but not necessarily where they start. I mean, Andy Street didn't, didn't start as, as a, 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 a budding conservative careerist. And he started as the, well, he, he reached the position of managing director of John Lewis and, and, and then moved into doing something completely different. So we, we shouldn't assume that the route to politics is a sort of ladder where you start at the parish council level and uh, you, you end up as a, a, a member of parliament. Shibani Mahotra. <laughs> Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, that's fine. Okay, great. Um, I guess my question, and I think um, the person after me, Alex, had a very similar question. Um, right now, the, the problem we have is that uh, the divide in the country isn't so much about Labour versus Conservatives, it's still about Brexit. And the problem is that um, people still take sides. And I, and I, I think uh, one of the presenters actually talked about Labour having to disappear. And I would disagree on that because I think there is the room for a center party, uh, which focuses on, I mean, the, I would say I'm a conservative and I feel disenfranch disenfranchised, but I haven't left as yet. But I don't dare criticize Brexit if I'm speaking to a conservative and nearly all the people I know that voted to remain have turned to labor. And I think a, a, an organization such as CGE needs to recognize this and 
um, start, start targeting or, or trying to include people that have similar goals, whether they are conservative or labor. I mean, those are just titles. A lot of them have very similar political um, kind of uh, goals. And it's just a definition depending on you know, who you voted for sometimes. But isn't it better to be more inclusive? Because otherwise, this is just uh, this is almost a think uh, think tank, and has very little impact on policy because it's not well recognized or uh, it doesn't have public support. Well, I I agree with quite a lot of that. I I don't think that Brexit is the big issue in the United Kingdom any longer. In some ways, I wish it were, but I think uh, most voters have, have got, moved on from mm. uh, from Brexit. I agree with you that we, we should be trying to draw back into the, the conservative political fold, the kind of people who may be drifting away, attracted by, by, by Labour. But the trouble is, were I to give advantage, a, a, a advice to, to somebody I actually loved or cared for, I feel I would be saying by saying, oh, join the Conservatives, go to your local Conservative Association meetings, uh, all that kind of stuff. I, 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 I would be inviting them into um, forums in which they're just going to get hurt and they're just going to, <laughs> their dislike of the party is going to be increased by greater acquaintance with it. So uh, I'm, I'm a little hesitant now uh, about where people should go or whether I should tell them to, to, to come back in, into a Conservative party that, that certainly in its attitude to, to, to Europe has, has changed irrevocably. And within the Conservative Party, I, I don't think there's any mileage any longer in, in uh, running the rejoin argument. Uh, the day may come when we do that, but for the moment, I think the argument we need to run is that as an hour, uh, an independent and detached uh, nation, we should still be friends of the European uh, Union. We should still see it as, along with the United States, one of the great forces for good in, in the world, and we should be doing our best to, to to, 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 to regard it as a comrade, as a, a Western comrade, ra rather than as uh, somebody to, whose kick, shins to kick. Um, may, I, may, may I just follow mm. up and clarify? Yes, I, I, go ahead. I wasn't, I wasn't talking, I mentioned uh, a centre party, but I think my, my question is more about the uh, CGE and its influence on policy. So we can all sit and talk about issues, etc. And I agree that voters aren't thinking about Brexit, but all the, gov all the conservative government's policies so far are very much um, aligned to what the Brexiters have wanted. And so there's been no compromise. And this group is, is one that's trying to push a more kind of moderate uh, pro-Europe um, um, agenda, but it's very hard to do when you're a conservative who's pro-Europe. Um, and and it, I think it, is, um, it, it behooves us to, kind of, to, to, to be more inclusive uh, and, and get, uh, more public support because without that, it, it, there's nothing to be done. I would like to hear David Liddington on that. Really, what what do you think, David? I think I think first of all, Matt. I think it's a, I think is I, I think I said when I took the chair of this organisation, it's this is a project that will take some years. Um, actually, trying to rebuild uh, a hearing and then uh, some influence for a more pro-European voice in the Conservative Party is not something that's going to be accomplished overnight. We're, we've had an earthquake and we're living through the aftershocks still. Mm. So I think you're looking at five years, um, possibly longer, to, of gradual rebuilding. Uh, and, and I think that um, one just... So part of this is patient and persistent. Articulating the arguments, it's trying to maintain relationships with centre-right parties in Europe. It's trying to engage an act with an act as a forum for business and environmental and other um, interests where this country's relationship with the European Union is inevitably a central part of policy thinking and policy making. And I, but I also think the, big, the biggest challenge um, is about how we actually try to get into a constructive dialogue with what I might term pragmatic levers. Um, you know, you, you've always written, Matthew, with, with, with great fondness about 
the sort of people who were members of the West Derbyshire Conservative mm. Association, you know, and you know, like you, you know, I don't know, many, I know many, many such in my years in, in the House. And they, a lot of those people voted to leave the European Union and they're not um, sort of red faced mad ideologues. Um, or pointy heads sort of sitting in garrets, um, sort, of, sort of agonizing about the evils of the European Union. And there's a strand, not just in the Conservative Party, but in the electorate, that finds the kind of politics embodied by Boris Johnson or in a different way by Ben Houchen as attractive and speaking to them. And it seems to be part of the trick we have to try to pull off is is to um, be able to to talk again to those people, and, and of course, it's the very last thing, in my view, that we we should be saying is, um, oh, the electorate got it terribly wrong, or, or you're all you're all racists and demagogues. I mean, that is that is absolutely fatal. Um, and I, I I I'm always quite pleased if I if I tweet something or write something, and I then get attacked in equal measure by people who were sort of Faragist and people who have got both the letters FBPE and a spider symbol um, after their, their Twitter handle. Uh, and I think I'm perhaps starting to get it right. But I think that how it's opening up, I don't know what your view is, but opening up that somehow, that, that conversation with people who don't automatically think of themselves as being in what we might term our camp, that, that is, I think, one of the, the, the central parts of the challenge we face. I've got who Malcolm Harbour. Uh, well, thank you very much, David and Matthew. You know, very stimulating, as always. Um, so I was a member of the European Parliament with my colleagues John uh, and Robert Atkins. Uh, so I've seen the influence of European political parties on uh, on strategy and uh, dimensions there. Uh, now my feeling is that the the EU is significant, Britain is significantly losing its influence in major global decision making fora outside the EU. Uh, uh, but I think that if we started to develop more, uh, uh, more detailed and more strategic links with the, with the European People's Party, uh, where, where John, uh, Robert, and myself you know, we're leaders of, of topic groups and committees in, in, in the European Parliament. And we have those well-established links that we might be able to have some, uh, be seen to have show the real influence that uh, we can have if we work with our European partners. Yes, yeah, so no, no, no response from me there, but besides saying that that, that sounds a thoroughly practical and uh, interesting suggestion. Um, I've got one from uh, Roger Martin. Roger, you're unmuted. We can't hear you at the moment. You're 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 um, muted, Roger. You have to press something to unmute. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> you're sounding like Ken Clark, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, if I, Roger, what Roger's saying is that Matthew, Matt, you've had yes. many years straddling both politics and the media. Yeah. With that perspective, do you feel sanguine about the years we're living through, or do you feel that we're moving into much deeper and more troubling waters for our society and for democracy as an ideal? I want to write about this, um, perhaps this Saturday. We are moving into deeper. Uh, and more troubling waters. And I think we need to remind ourselves of some of the verities of the 20th century, which is that the West is best, um, that Western democratic societies um, are the best, and are ultimately, will ultimately be the most successful, and that uh, we need to get alongside um, uh, the Merkels or whoever CDU person succeeds her, alongside the, the Macrons, alongside the Joe Bidens, 
and that any any idea that we're that the world is is now going to be one in in which uh, Victor Orban and our relationships with him um, uh, are something that we should try to cultivate is wrong, and it's wrong for all the reasons we we knew in the the twentieth century. Um, we, we 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 know that liberalism um, is best. We know that, that that personal freedom is best. We know that human rights matter. We know that democracy matters. We know that there are terrible threats. Um, I think rather less from Russia, which is a sort of hooligan country, than from the Chinese Communist Party. And, and in that world, I think we need to remember again who we are in, in, in the West. I'm, I'm going to try to develop that thought and uh, see where I take it perhaps on, on Saturday. I, I see Dominic Grieve there, and I, I, I honestly can't miss the opportunity j just to, to get a comment or two from Dominic on how things are are going, a man whom I, I admire more than I can say. Is there some way Dominic can unmute? <laughs> I'm unmuted, yes, it's been ahead. done. I think David has pressed the button. I, I agree with that analysis. I think that we are um, going into very murky waters um, and we have to place emphasis on our own values um, and to show that we're capable of solving problems for people, which I think at the moment we're not very good at doing. I was going to ask you, Matthew, the question I had my hand up was that I agreed with you about everything you said about Northern Ireland. Indeed, the Irish know very well that reunification against the wishes of the, the loyalist, even a small section of the loyalist community would be disastrous, just as we had the troubles because of a small minority of nationalist Republicans who wouldn't accept the status quo. Um, but we are actually, um, this is going to be my question to you, if you could answer it. We're actually heading for a really serious crisis over the Northern Ireland Protocol. And, I, and I'm not sure that any of us in United Kingdom, in Great Britain, are really putting our shoulder to the wheel about explaining to the EU, let alone, I know it's been caused by Boris Johnson's shameless uh, behaviour, just how I think serious it is, unless a sensible solution is come up with whereby people in Northern Ireland can have their sausage meat uh, delivered from Scotland and not told that they're actually living in a separate universe. Um, and to marry that back up with the other question, we've got to be problem solvers because our values are right, but we are going to be facing huge problems. We only have to look at what's happening in the channel. We only look at what's happening in the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. And we, are, we will be we will be overcome by this unless we show resilience. And that means building the cooperation with our closest neighbours, because the United States is several thousand miles away and Australia and New Zealand, interesting and lovely places as they are, much further. I can't add to that, uh, Dominic. I entirely agree. And I, I, I do think that if we had someone of a different disposition from Lord Frost, David Frost, yeah. That the the problems over the protocol are so yeah. obviously soluble. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, we know what the protocol is there to stop. It's to stop smuggling things in yeah. or out uh, via Northern Ireland. We we will know if that begins to happen, and we can act. And and short of that, uh, there, there has to be a compromise. I, I I agree with the comment. And the compromise is is attainable. It is it is. It is there if there is a willingness to to find it. I think that isn't the problem. I mean, Dominic will know, know this too. It's the absence of trust. Yes, on both sides. Real yes. obstacle now. Yes. Um, I think it's 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 seven twenty eight, uh, and we do like to keep to the sixty minutes for our meeting. So I'm going to draw it to a close. With apologies to those who've tabled questions uh, and have not been called. Can I first of all? Um, to give wholehearted thanks to Matthew for giving up time to uh, come and speak to us today and, and for engaging in um, you know, a, a constructive, but also very frank conversation, um, which is what one would hope for. Um, but I think, Matt, you've delivered um, uh, in, in spades on, on, on that this evening. Can I thank John Bowis, too, for uh, his, uh, his contribution in interviewing Matthew for the first half of our session this evening. Uh, for those who are not yet members but want to find out more about the group and to join, hopefully, um, please look at the, the website, uh, Conservative European.
forum.org uh, uh, and our next meetings are the 21st of June at 6 p.m. where Claire Perry O'Neill will be speaking to us and answering questions about climate change, uh, looking ahead to the Glasgow summit in the autumn and beyond. And then we have our annual general meeting on the 6th of July, again at 6 p.m. Thank you very much indeed to everybody who, who, who came along. Thanks again to Matt and to John. I formally declare the meeting closed.